Wow. What do I say after that? Thank you so, so much, Wanjiko, Dr. Kabira. For those of you who are professors here, you know now what to do for your students to be good to you. Give them an A. <laughs> But <laughs> she has set me up here because neither am I smoking a cigarette, nor am I naked, so I can't run away, I'm here to stay. As for the um, young lady who told um, the vice chancellor that I'm radicalizing people here, hey, you know I could be put in prison for that. <laughs> But trust me, I don't work with those people. I don't. So um, thank you so, so much. That was a beautiful introduction, and I appreciate it greatly. I do want to begin also by recognizing um, a number of people here. At the, um, I think, uh, and I really do think, uh, uh, making the mistake of leaving some people out, but I think you will forgive me. Um, I want to um, recognize the presence of the Chief Justice, Willie Mutonga, who is also a friend and a colleague and a comrade. I'd like to recognize uh, Justice Mungo, and um, I'd also like to recognize the Vice Chancellor of the Acting Vice Chancellor of the Institution uh, here with us, and um, then the founders. Uh, of this great place that I am convinced is going to be a model university in many, many ways. And believe me, even though I am rather circuitous in my uh, speech, I definitely do not say too many things to flatter anybody. I have that problem of not being able to flatter. And believe me, as I said to another audience of students, I have not been asked to do a commercial for the Gachukias, for this university. But I will do a commercial and say in all seriousness, this is a place that tells me that the founders that many of us know as leaders, as educators, and so on, have had a vision, as Professor um, Kabira uh, said, that is going to take this place very, very far. So I do recognize you. I recognize Alan and Juju. I recognize my colleagues at um, this uh, institution. And now I want to practice a little bit of nepotism and recognize my family. I'm really delighted to see, especially Mr. Kiraini here. I've never seen him at any of my speeches. <laughs> So I, I don't know what it took, and that's why I have to be very, very careful not to hold a cigarette or do anything to that sort before he departs. And my sister, Dr. Kiereni, who is always extremely, extremely supportive, more on nepotism, I see a sister who just came in there, and brother-in-law, uh, uh, Mrs. Marekia, and um, uh, I... The audience is so big. If you're my relative, don't be ashamed of me. Stand up. Let me, let me recognize you. Anybody? Oh, my nieces, my brother, my cousin. Thank you so, so much for coming. And all my many, many friends that I see in front of me here, whom I cannot call out name by name. And I see a cousin by my former marriage who has refused to be counted among my relatives. That's okay, but she is here, <laughs> Dr. Kamau. And um, all of you, thank you so, so much for coming here. <laughs> I, I know that you had better things to do at home and to come here. I will try to make this as painless as, as possible. And um, whatever happens, please don't run away before I finish. And um, I'm not going to repeat the story of the professor that I told before. I will leave um, that um, aside. I want to say, though, before I begin speaking, what a warm, warm welcome I have received here at Riera from the acting vice chancellor, um, the founders, the um, heads and deans of the various schools. And it really has been an exceptional, exceptional kind of welcome that I, I have not seen this kind of welcome um, anywhere. Um, in my hotel, you know, 
which they have booked a nice suite. I wondered what to do at the end of the day because it was a huge, huge basket of fruit, a huge bouquet of flowers, and um, I was being pushed a little bit, you know, I, I just thought this is amazing. So let's thank Rihanna for giving me this chance to be here. I want to correct one or two misunderstandings before I begin, and one of it has to do um, with the fact that I know there have been some sources because I was asked a question yesterday as to whether I actually did graduate from the University of Toronto in 1975, and the answer is no. I graduated from the University of New Brunswick in 1973, but there is someone who went onto the internet and put that 75 um, number there when I was at the University of Nairobi teaching already, and everybody has gone by that. So what I say does not matter, but please remember it matters. I want to correct that. The other piece of misinformation, not misinformation, but different interpretations that I want to put here, because it's in the papers and I've had to correct it before, has to do with um, the time when my colleagues and I were working um, under um, you know, a, 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 a very difficult circumstances and going through all kinds of unpleasant experiences, including some of them imprisonment and detention, including, by the way, your chief justice. He was once in, in prison and detention. Isn't that amazing? Shall we give him a word for surviving? Yeah, but um, they keep saying that I was imprisoned. I didn't actually go to serve time in prison, but I was in and out of, you know, cells or interrogation from time to time, you know, but I got home, you know, soon thereafter or um, a day later or so. The second one has to do with torture. I was never taken to near your chambers, no. But if we think of torture as psychological, as a verbal abuse, if we think of torture as when you are answering um, questions and your head is being bashed on the desk, if we think of torture as threats, you know, being taken to hear noises to frighten you that if you are not careful, we will take you where those noises are coming from. Um, if we think um, of torture as being threatened that you're going to be taken into a private room and checked out in order for them to know whether you are male or female, um, if you think of torture as abuse that tells you, well, come that you even have children, an animal like you, you are not fit to have, you know, um, uh, children like those, that, that's it. But I want to make it clear, I was never taken to any chambers for torture. I don't want to be like that one man who had scars all over the face, the hands, and so on. And he used to tell people he was in the liberation struggle. But the people who had been in the liberation struggle had never seen this man anywhere in the fighting areas. And so one day one man came and, and, and started pointing out to this man with the scars all over. So you see him? You see all those? I did it. I did it on him. And people said, oh, it was a private horror. And this is where this man got his scars from. But he was touting as a freedom fighter. So I don't want to claim any credit or any pain that I never went through. That said, um, let me begin by saying this is a long, long topic, and um, uh, Professor Kabira um, said I, I will do a good job of it. I, I'm not so sure, but I will try. The topic is a home away from home, a biographical sketch of working in the diaspora and working in the context of the African-American African-African dialogue. Now, this is another setup. How do you completely cover that topic? It is so wide. I don't know what to do with it. But I do want to say that this topic, a home away from home, is one that I want to dedicate to my daughters, uh, Mombi, who um, you know is still alive, and, and Jerry, who passed away uh, some while ago. 
and to also say that Ncheri is an old girl of Riera at the kindergarten level. So I'm dedicating this poem to them because this whole um, topic of a home away from home is something I cannot speak about without thanking them because I don't think I would have survived it without them. And uh, therefore, I will begin by reading a poem from my mother's poem and other songs that I wrote and dedicated to them following one session in those interrogation spaces where I was being told I'm not fit to be a mother, I'm an, an animal, and so on. And in rebellion, as those of you who are in the arts know, you talk back. If you are in space where you can't talk back without getting into a lot of trouble, then you look for ways of talking back. And writing, as well as imagining, is really a tool for talking back, for naming yourself differently from the way you have been named. So I'm saying in this poem, I'm actually not an animal, but in actual fact, the generation that is, you know, um, uh, 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 that includes my children, uh, um, are people who will give birth to a different moment than we are having right now. So I will read you that poem, and I think that I'm being actually quite daring to read the poem because it was read to us. Um, the other day by a student here at Riera, her guy, and done so beautifully that if I mess it up, please understand. And I would like some response. And by the way, I forgot to say thank you for that beautiful recitation. Let's give her a hand again here. So if I mess up the recitation, since you did your so well, you will understand too. I do want a response from you because today I'm going to adopt orature as a method of delivery in, you know, uh, giving my talk. And I would like you to say the beautiful ones who are born. When I point out to you, please say the beautiful ones who are born. Again. And if you feel too lazy to not to say, don't worry, I won't take it to heart. Um, but the poem is called Birth for My Daughters, Mombi and Jerry, Companions, Friends, and Unfailing Comrades in the Struggle, especially during our mountainous life in exile. The beautiful ones were born. The beautiful ones were born under leopard skies, under roaring thunder, under flooding rain, under drowning earth. The beautiful ones were born before the grandeur of the majestic Rift Valley over Kilimanjaro in defiance, up Kirinyaga in awesome victory. The beautiful ones were born in the land of Mekatilili, the home of Koitalel Eos Arab Samoye, on the soil of Mudonua Kerima, the birthright of Kimathiwa Wachiori. The beautiful ones were born. They were born over the spoils of Karen Blexen, along the horse tracks of Lord Delamere, above the adventures of Elspeth Axley, amidst the bullets of colonial guns. The beautiful ones were born in the human jungles of neocolonial treachery and a person eat person development economics. The beautiful ones were born amidst howling jackals and scavenging hyenas and uh, stampeding elephants and pouncing wild tigers inside the mouths of galloping ogres. The beautiful ones were born through hours of pain, in the heat of battle, at the heart of the struggle, under the binding bulbs of interrogation chambers. The beautiful ones were born against chilling winds, under the scorching sun amidst hunger and drought, around cries of piercing agony through dehumanization and death. The beautiful ones were born, they were born in the lowlands of despair, through valleys of elusive hope, across ridges of obstinate resistance on the highlands of mounting optimism by the flowing rivers of momentous triumph. This phrase, the beautiful ones who are born, comes from Aikwe Ama's title, or is a version of Aikwe Ama 
title, um, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. And I'm arguing they were born a long time ago in our ancestors, in our grandmothers and aunts and so on, and in their children and generations before us. It's a poem of hope, and I agree with you, hope is very, very important. Allow me to begin with um, the concept of birth. The concept of birth and, and what this means. And also to tie that together, um, the concept of hope. In fact, because I don't want to take a very long time, let me focus on home, the concept of home, because it's a part of our topic uh, this afternoon. And what do we mean by home? When we talk of home, we think of a warm place to which we belong. There is connotation of belonging, of rootedness. There is connotation of a space that facilitates connection, connection with our people, with brothers and sisters, with our relatives, so on and so forth. Connection with the past, our ancestors and those who have gone before us. A place where there is history and a history we associate with and know and hopefully love with family and community, with even geography, the lovely trees we see around us and the rivers and the mountains and the way that we know that, um, you know, there will be a season of cold and a season of warm. We know there will be a rhythmical season of planting and rain and so on. We are in rhythm with life when we are at home. It's a place that has familiar, familiar environmental um, impactful forces that are all around us. It's a place where we hear ourselves being validified, a place of validification where one feels acknowledged, recognized, and affirmed, validated. And I do want to say that it's been very, very moving, this idea of being home and feeling recognized and loved and wanted. Home is a place where we can say we have a comfort zone. And I do want to um, say here in talking of home and uh, Professor Kabir, Kabira's points that um, my, uh, the Kiranis have provided home every time I have come here. My other sisters who are here and brothers and so on, my friends, you have given me a sense that has made me feel I'm embraced, I'm at home. So that concept of home is critical and it's very important in order for us to go uh, on this journey of the topic that I'm tackling. Now I want to go beyond this and say that departure from home is therefore um, a very, very difficult um, you know, move. Uh, and let me first of all say that there are two departures or ways of leaving home. There is voluntary departure where I choose to leave and go for some reason, either to better my life or to have a change in life or whatever. Voluntary departure from home. But there is also forced departure from home um, where the traveler, and the person who is leaving has no choice and no say in what is happening. Now, I want to argue that all departures are difficult. Um, you know, you are cutting, um, you know, uh, strings and, and so forth. Uh, departures um, can sometimes be temporary, but they can also be permanent. But as one is leaving, not knowing is this a temporary kind of departure or is it a permanent departure? It can be a very, very frightening move to make. Now, leaving home, as I say, even voluntarily, because you want to do so, is difficult. And, and we get nostalgic once we get to the other end because we are missing home. But when one leaves home under enforced circumstances, the fear of the unknown multiplies and becomes really, really frightening because you don't know what you're going to find at the other end. And um, you don't know whether you're going to be able to build a home when you arrive at the other end. So then, leaving home under this second set of circumstances can be painful, it can be traumatizing. It means disruption, 
it means disconnection, it means alienation, it means psychological trauma at times, and in fact, a very, very difficult space to, to enter. I say this because as we look at our connection with African Americans, I'm really going to ask us to think very seriously about what they went through having been forced to leave their homes and having been taken into slavery. But I will come back um, to this. I want first of all to ask why? Why um, is this understanding necessary of what African Americans went through and the reason why um, I have found association with African Americans so empowering and so embracing. Uh, not to say that this is not the case with other Americans. Why is it that I have been able to bond so easily with African Americans? And I say this because there are some African people who just find it impossible and difficult to bond with black people in the diaspora for reasons that I don't want to accuse them of being negative or whatever, but people experience situations differently. And I'm just happy that my, my experience has been so positive. So why is it important for me and for us to understand what African Americans are doing through? Number one, because we really need to explode a lot of myths and stereotypes that we associate with African Americans and that I hear even from some of the best people. Secondly, we need to recognize the pain that they went through in history and how in fact miraculous it is that they were able to survive and have formed a part of the population of American people. And lastly, because I want to demonstrate that the ties that bind us are so real in terms of historical and political experiences that we need to really think ways of opening a dialogue with them if we have not already done so because we have been through very similar experiences. I, this title again, the, 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 the bonds that bind us, um, you know, is coming from Bernard Magumbane's book of that title, where he positions Pan-Africanism as a possible solution to this. And I am going to come and, you know, uh, push that um, theory in a little while. Um, when I call upon you, Wananchi, please say yes or yo. Wananchi. If, 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 if I ask you, are you asleep? I don't know whether you're going to say yes or no, but if I ask you, are you awake? Are you still with me? Please say yes, say nam, say nam, say whatever you want to say to assure me you are here. Wananchi, are you still with me? Okay, we can proceed then. Wananchi, shall I proceed? Okay. <laughs> don't say no before I finish. <laughs> I, if I have any enemy here, don't behave like that man in the church who waited for the priest to ask, has anybody got any word against this wedding couple? And after very dramatic silence, somebody at the back says, yay, I've got it. But when the priest followed uh, up the matter, realized that this was a, a local drunkard wandered into the wedding. So if there are any local drunkards here, please <laughs> just let me go on. So, Wananchi, shall I proceed? Okay. So, leaving home then is a very, very difficult, difficult situation. I want to speak therefore a little bit about the transatlantic slave trade which took place from about 1502 to 1841 but some people say really it went on until the 1900s and for those of you who have seen um, a film that has come out um, rather not so recently though the memoir of Solomon Northup which has come out um, in the um, you know, title of um, 12 Years a Slave, in which our local star, Lupita Nyong'o, performed so well that she received an award. Hands up if you have seen the film. Thank you. It's amazing. But that film shows that even the, after the former abolition of slavery, enslavement went on. It's really scary. And today there are forms of enslavement that still go on that um, we need to think about. So 
the um, transatlantic slave trade. Now, what is the connection between this and home? People of African origin, mostly from the area of West Africa, and especially the countries along the coast of West Africa, and also from, um, you know, lower down Angola, the Congo, and so on, were actually abducted. They were seized um, by um, empire builders uh, across and taken in as slaves, as enslaved people. Now, you can imagine... You are sitting one day and doing your gardening or doing your cooking or whatever it is or telling stories and people come with guns and they literally take hold of you and you're gone and that's it. For those of you who have visited um, Dakar and uh, Senegal and um, you know have gone to um, where enslaved people used to be from, you will agree it's one of the saddest moments that you see. You know, the door of no return, which is also there in Cape Coast in Ghana, um, where enslaved people would leave. And that's it. And before them, there is nothing but water. They would go into those um, slave ships, but before, in fact, they entered the slave ships. And the reason African Americans and African Caribbeans are so sensitive about calling the places in Cape Coast and, um, you know, um, uh, Senegal and um, Goree Island in Senegal and, um, you know, other places, castles, slave castles, is because they see them as prisons, as dungeons. Uh, people who were captured were put in dungeons and occupying little space in huge numbers. Those of you who have seen Haile Gerima's work, um, you know, uh, Sankofa, and also um, his wife, Shirikiana Aina, Professor Shirikiana Aina, The Door of No Return, we all know the dramatized notion of what happened with those people. Okay, so you are taken out and you're put in ships in chains. And in those chains, um, having those chains, you just have to do the necessary way it has to be done, if you understand what I mean by the necessary. So um, you're also with other people, you go for days and days without food, you're being whipped for no um, you know, good reason and so on. And many people died in that passage that we call the Middle Passage as they crossed the Atlantic in order to go into the lands of slavery.